Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I know some people tune in from all over the place, but wherever you are, welcome to the Sensitive Stability BPD live morning show. Um, today, we are going to be talking about the loved ones, the people in our lives um, with BPD or without BPD, right? Uh, it could be a partner, could be our children, um, could be parents siblings, friends, family, um, these people need to be represented as well. And a lot of times BPD has a way of sort of taking the stage, right? Taking the spotlight to the point where a lot of these um, other opinions fall to the wayside. Um, but we love the people in our lives, uh, us who have BPD. Um, we oftentimes have that whole fear of abandonment thing for a reason, right? It's because we want to be loved. We want to love. We want to share passion. We want to share that type of connection, right? So, you know, we need to say a few words about, about the people in our lives who are suffering right alongside us. And believe me when I say that they are suffering alongside us. Um, I do not mean to say that they are suffering the same way because they're not. They're not suffering the same way, but I do mean to say that they are suffering as well. Uh, and that oftentimes goes o overlooked. Now, as we are on the road to remission, to getting better, to getting rid of borderline personality disorder, we start improving and then we may notice some of our partner's grievances coming through, right? Um, and the thing about it is uh, it can be a discouraging part of the journey because, uh, you know, we're starting to see things improve and now all of a sudden we have to deal with the things that um, our partner or our loved ones are going to complain about. The reason this happens is because oftentimes in a relationship with somebody who has BPD, it almost becomes, it is very much like this, uh, you start walking on eggshells. You can't really say what you truly think. You can't really, you know, have um, an, an honest opinion. You have to modify your entire language, your entire person in order to benefit the BPD person, right? So if you are say a husband or a wife of someone who has BPD, you might find yourself in this position rather frequently where you know you should say something. You want to say something, but you struggle to say it because you know that the BPD person will take it a certain way. And we will. I call this the BPD filter, okay? Much like a filter, um, you know, uh, let's say on, on TikTok, you know, words go through a filter and they, you know, the curse words, let's say, you know, uh, on a social platform might come up as exclamation point, you know, uh, ampersand, you know what I'm saying? Like just a bunch of little characters, it's a filter, right? Or the filter that we use on TikTok to change our face, you know, you, you hit the cute little filter button, you start looking like an elf, you know what I mean? That's a filter. Well, there is something called a BPD filter, and this is audio and thought-based, as we hear and see you do and say things, it goes through this filter, but it comes out the other side, something totally different. You know what I mean? Uh, a lot of times it could be someone in your life saying something positive. You know, we will, we will take, as, as people with BPD, we will take a positive compliment and find a way to make it an insult and a threat to us. I know that sounds really crazy, but that, that's what it's like. And we don't, we don't see it. We don't plan it. We're not orchestrating it. It's not a conscious effort. Uh, it's just something that happens. For those of you who just joined, the topic today is loved ones of people with BPD. David Keck is a sensitive stability coach as well. He is a moderator and in the chat. So if you have any questions that you would really like me to answer, please direct it to him. It's very hard for me to um, run this morning show and also read the chat. Uh, but that's what he's there for to make sure you're heard and you're seen, uh, give him a follow while you're at it. So, um, that said the people in our lives who love us will walk on eggshells in order to appease our behavior, to pacify us, right. To, to placate us. And, and that's, and BPD is a borderline personality disorder. Okay. Um, it is kind of a step further uh, nacho cheese than, than bipolar. That's the way I look at it. They are two different uh, conditions. Bipolar is primarily mood-based and might have 
everybody says the big difference is that it has longer stretches of mood uh, swings up and down and it can, but BPD can also be like that if you split. So I don't want to say that that's the defining factor. Bipolar is primarily mood based while BPD is a personality disorder. Okay. It's a totally different thing. Um, we also have some core features like the fear of abandonment, which creates part of our problems. Uh, it means that our partners can never rest. It means that the, our loved ones, you know, um, always have to watch what they say and, and make sure that they understand when it goes through our filter um, that it is received as as good as possible. Um, Johan says, Johan, uh, excuse me if I pronounce that wrong. What's a good way to give a compliment to someone with BPD? Well, that's an easy one. Um, it, giving us the compliments is the easy thing. And that's because we are dying for attention. We are dying for compliments, right? So uh, anything that you think is positive about our personality or our character is is going to be received very well. If if I were part of a support system of somebody who had BPD and I wanted to compliment that person, I would make sure that the compliment surrounded a personality trait that that looks real to me. I wouldn't say um, something that's superficial, something that isn't true. I would say something that's about their core person. You know, you are so passionate about your work. I love that about you because we wanna reinforce their identity. A lot of times as BPD people, we don't really know our identity, okay? We don't really know our identity. And I mean, we know some stuff about us. Uh, a lot of what we know about ourselves, we don't like. We have poor self image, we can't validate. So we don't want to um, fill their pot with things that are counterproductive. Uh, we have another question here. Have you ever talked on here about BPD eyes? Um, I'll be honest, I don't know what BPD eyes is, but if you mean, I, I am talking about something called a BPD filter, which might be um, kind of the same thing, maybe, I suspect, in which the things that we perceive, the things that we hear, go through the filter, come out the other side as something totally different. Talking to us is a lot like playing the telephone game. You remember that game as a kid where somebody in the start would, would pick up a phone and they'd say something and, and, you know, they pretend to pick up a phone. They whisper it to the person next to them. That person whispers it all the way down the table. By the time it gets to the end, it's not the same anymore. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. <laughs> but that's a good compliment. That's a great example. That's a great example. Um, you know, if, if somebody, if somebody's attractive, you could say, you know, you're attractive. If someone's intelligent, you could say, you're intelligent. Um, just be honest and always focus on things that are real because we want to bolster real positive um, change and we want them to solidify their identity. Uh, that is part of the way to get out of BPD. If you want to succeed in this, if you want to get to remission, um, then you have to figure out and admit and know and own exactly who you are. Okay. That's the truth. And it's difficult to do that if you're surrounding yourself with people who don't know the real you, um, don't care about uh, your ultimate end goal in life or you as a real person. If you feel surrounded yourself with superficial friends, for instance, um, that kind of thing, um, you're not going to get there as quickly. So you have to be honest and assess your situation and say, you know, who's in my life? You know, hello. Um, some of our regulars are here. I uh, really appreciate everybody who comes every day. You make this community great and exactly what it is. Uh, for those of you who are joining late, the topic this morning are BPD loved ones, um, the people in our lives who suffer right along with us. Orange juice. Cheers, guys. So that said, um, there's no limit to the amount of suffering uh, when it comes to BPD. After 50, good morning, nice to see you again, says, if someone is with a therapist for years and still can't regulate, does it fall on the, and I'm guessing that the next line is therapist? Yeah, okay, great, 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 great. Uh, well, you know what? I don't believe that there are therapists or doctors or mental health professionals out there who can cure BPD unless they have suffered from it. That is the critical element here. That is the element that makes it work. You can have um, a therapist that's well-versed and has studied this their entire life, but they're not going to be able to relate to you. 
you know, they're going to sit there probably like this, write some notes. I do this too, by the way. I mean, when I coach, but um, after you're done talking, they're, they're not going to know what it was like to experience the problem. And that's where the issue lies because uh, to fix BPD, I have found you have to have experienced it. Um, that is just, that's just necessary. I've seen so many therapists in my lifetime and their skill set was very high. I've done DBT, all sorts of stuff, right? And ultimately, uh, they weren't able to help me through it. Now, that's the same with a loved one, right? Loved ones cannot cure this. They cannot fix this. No matter how bad you love your partner, you know, who has, who might have BPD, right? You can't fix them directly, right? So, it's going to always take an outside eye. Totally true. It's also always going to take somebody, in my opinion, who has been through it. And and that's, you don't need help necessarily to get better if you apply yourself correctly, like, like I did, for instance. But it took me 12 years. It took me 12 years to get through this of trying every day, super hardcore. Um, but for, for instance, for reference, the people who work with me end up in remission, generally speaking, in under two months. That's insane, insanely fast, uh, but it happens because I experienced it. So I hear your story and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember, I remember. Let me tell you a story <laughs> and I have a story for every story you tell me. Ashley, good morning to you. Good to see you. My therapist recommended um, the body keeps score. Any thoughts? Um, therapists have all types of different techniques and they invent their own terminologies they invent their own stuff um which i have as well it's it's not um a bad practice but in terms of the body keeps score um i would need elaboration to know exactly what the therapist means but i have a version of that that helps very much i call it the emotional tank and monitoring the emotional tank so you know throughout the day i will be saying to myself how am i feeling you know, and, and whenever I notice a negative emotion, I'm like, okay, well, my, I know I can only handle so much before I explode. Right. So what's in my tank and how can I de delineate what's in there? What created, what created, um, you know, this, this kind of thing. No, I, I haven't read that book. Um, I have read a ton of books. I mean, just countless, countless books, but you know, there's always new books. That's the truth. And I'll tell you every book I read, I'll be completely honest about this, and I don't think I'm exaggerating at all. Every book I read on BPD helped me more than any therapist I've ever seen. Does that kind of give some insight in terms of um, how helpful therapy was for me? It wasn't helpful. It was therapeutic. It was therapeutic, but it wasn't resolution. It wasn't an answer. It wasn't, you know, remission, uh, if that makes sense. Remission came from perspective changes, a buildup of skills of which I got more out of books than I did out of therapists, for example, right? And achieving validation. <clears throat> I, I actually have a lot of people who tell me they tried EMDR and they say it, it was helpful like anything else. Like I would say everything I've tried is helpful, but I have not had one single person tell me that EMDR actually cured their BPD. Um, and if there was a comment or two here or there, you know, if somebody's saying that, I suspect it might not be in full remission because I don't believe that EMDR has what it takes to do that uh, ultimately. I think it has what it takes to, yes, as Living with BPD said, treat some trauma, um, you know, help you uh, self with self-awareness, that kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's not, it's not worth doing. Everything is worth doing, guys. If you are sick of this and you want out of it, then you need to make it a full-time mission a full-time job. Um, and, and it will feel exhausting at first. It will feel exhausting. And we need to make sure that our support system, our loved ones that, that we surround ourselves with are supportive. Likewise, in our journey, we have to start to understand the stuff that we have done or the things that our loved ones have experienced, which has made their life hard. Okay. And I totally get it, Ashley. You know, I get that a lot. I get that a whole lot, um, but I am walking, talking, living, singing, dancing proof sometimes um, that it is curable. I haven't had a single episode, a single split, a single symptom in like 
years, years. Uh, and the trick is uh, filling all the gaps. Um, the reason it feels like it can't be cured, two reasons. Number one, the stigma. The entire mental health community ha is, is telling you that it can't be cured, which I think is very grossly irresponsible. The second reason is it, it's such a debilitating condition. It's so hard to live with BPD that I don't feel like a lot of us could even see the light. You know, I, I remember there were times in my journey when I was thinking, man, there is just no way I will ever beat this. There is no way that I will ever get through this. That's depressing. It's a depressing thought, but it's a real thought that many of us have, and it is how it is, right? Uh, and they're, they're, I mean, they're right. It's, it's the most, it's one of the most difficult conditions to treat, I would say outside of maybe schizophrenia. I think schizophrenia is a little harder to treat, but BPD is right up there, man. It's right up there. And like I keep saying, the people in our lives are suffering too. Our children suffer, our parents suffer. And now if you have kids, if, if you have children in your life, um, this is something to pay attention to because it is highly contagious. It is a highly contagious condition. It's already genetic, you know, and then you consider the fact that um, environmental, it's activated through environment. Yeah, actually, um, comment, I, I kind of touched base on that, but it is 100% curable. And I am the only person that I know who is in a position like I'm in who is saying that. But it's also my life mission to prove that it's curable. So, you know, I mean, if there's a cure to cancer, somebody's going to figure it out eventually, right? If there's a cure to polio, somebody figures it out, you know? Um, and yes, Annie, uh, BPD is considered roughly 50% genetic and 50% environmental. So there are very specific genes that they have identified in, in studies that this very real thing that are being labeled as BPD genes. If you have these genes, you are significantly more likely to have BPD. Do you need them to get BPD? No. Um, then there are genes that and, and BPD is borderline personality disorder. Then there are genes which kind of promote symptoms that we have, genes that might make you predisposed to depression or apathy, genes that might make you um predisposed to anger or aggression or impulsivity. And if you have some of these genes, for instance, then you are naturally more likely to develop BPD because you obviously will develop, are more likely to develop the symptoms. But then it's activated by environmental influence. So an invalidating environment, parents leaving, um, you know, separation, divorce, a parent passing away, um, seeing the display of behaviors uh, from your parents, for example, all of these kinds of things um, sort of activate it. Now, it's it's a shame when it's activated, that's for sure, but there's nothing that we can do about it ahead of time as the person with BPD. We are definitely starting out life as victims. So remember that. Ashley says, my 11-year-old is showing signs and I'm concerned. Any tips or direction um, from y'all? I love you. Thank you. We love you too. First of all, um, if... You know, I, I work with kids, um, not as often as I work with adults, but I do work with kids. And usually I prefer them to be, uh, you know, around 12 at least. But I have worked with kids as young as eight and had some diversion and success, uh, so to speak. You can't teach them the same things that you could teach an adult the same way. But you can teach them how to interact with the world in a safer way. A safer way. For instance, I had one client who was telling me um, she's doing great. She's on her way to remission. She was telling me about how her eight-year-old son was starting to display symptoms, right? And for instance, he had gotten angry at a video game and threw the controller at the TV and broke the TV. And, uh, you know, she's like, all right, well, now we got to go get a new TV. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm like, Part of the problem with BPD is that we live our lives without consequences. You know, our actions are so severe, so crazy that the people around us fear it so much that they get conditioned to the condition. 
I'm like, if you go buy this eight year old a new TV the day after he wrecks his, his first TV, like, what do you think that, what, what's the message there? When I destroyed my entire house and I had to pay $30,000 the next day for new furniture and repair two cars that I crashed into each other, I didn't do that again. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't do that again. <clears throat> now, sure, I would smash a cell phone previously and then smash another one and smash another one because I could afford the two, three, four, five hundred dollars it cost at the time, you know, back in the day uh, to just replace it. Not a big deal. But when they have to pay the penalty, you know, I'm not saying make this eight year old necessarily pay, find a way to pay three hundred dollars for a TV. But what I am saying is, you know, doing the dishes is worth eight dollars. You see, here's the chart. Um, little dude, you want a new TV? You need to do the dishes 17 times. You need to do this four times. Make them understand the error of their ways. That is my buddy, Sam. I love it when Sam comes. Thank you for that. Both my parents have BPD, all three of my siblings. It does run in the family. It is a very genetic condition. And that is, um, it's unfortunate because we can't choose that situation, right? We can't choose it. My father probably had BPD. He was undiagnosed. Uh, if he tried to get a diagnosis, then he probably would have gotten antisocial personality disorder or something like that. Um, because typically they didn't prescribe or, uh, sorry, they didn't diagnose men back in the day with BPD. They thought it was a, a white female condition. Isn't that, isn't that something else right there? You know, but I have full blown BPD for sure. I know that. Uh, as David says, David is a sensitive stability coach in the chat. He is a moderator for this live. Uh, we will be accepting guests for questions uh, at 730. The second half of the show, it's completely okay to dial in. If you have over a thousand followers, you want to be on the show for a few minutes, you need to talk about something or share something. That's, that's what the second half of the show is for. Um, otherwise, I will just keep running my mouth, right? Uh, after 50 says, how did your BPD affect your relationship with your parents? Oh, well, my parents didn't believe in mental illness. Um, despite the fact that there was a clear problem in my behavior, my entire childhood, they just ignored it. They kept saying, well, no, there's no such thing. You're totally fine. You're totally normal. Everything's, everything's normal. When clearly it wasn't normal. I mean, I was bashing my head into the concrete, stuff like that. I was already into self-harm. I was already manipulating people. I was already throwing fits that, you know, you can't tell as easy when it's a kid throwing a fit because, you know, temper tantrums. Kids throw temper tantrums. But even in my young adolescence and, you know, right up to about 2021, they were still saying, oh, there's nothing wrong with our kids. Nothing wrong with our kids. It was super invalidating. There was a point in my journey to remission when I admitted to myself that I have this condition um, where I had to cut them out of my life for a couple hours or a couple days. <laughs> Jesus. Couple years. Couple hours. Yeah, I stopped talking to my parents for like two hours back in uh, 2010. <laughs> no, for real. I had to cut them out of my life for, for two whole years because they were that invalidating. It was that difficult to be around them. You know, I, I couldn't make any progress. And the progress that I made, they just invalidated. They nullified all of my progress. Uh, and I hate that. I hate that about it. Um, it's, it's partly because they don't want to be responsible. But what they're not understanding is the big, big picture, which is that they're not responsible for it either. Neither is their parents or their parents or their parents. You know, uh, well, they might be directly responsible, but that's not their fault. You know what I'm saying? Just like it's not our fault that we get it. It's also not their fault. Eleanor says, is there a medication to take uh, that helps or is this something you can uh, overcome by changing habits? Great question. Man, that orange juice is good this morning. There's no medication for borderline personality disorder, period. There's nothing out there that's specifically made for BPD. Now, with that said, uh, roughly 80% of the people that I work with are trying some type of active medicine and it's not working, it's because they prescribe the medicine for symptoms. And you have to bear in mind that most mental health professionals have no idea what to do with a BPD person. They have no clue. So they say, okay, well, we'll give them lithium. Okay, we'll put them on Lexapro. Let's do the antidepressant. Let's do the anti-anxiety. Let's do the mood stabilizers. Um, I, I'll tell you, almost every single medicine made my life tremendously worse 
Um, I had one, uh, I believe it was a, a psychologist or a psych a psychiatrist of some kind. It might've been a nurse practitioner. It's hard to say because I was, I was rather young. She met with me and I didn't know about BPD at the time. You know, I was just meeting with her to figure out what it was. She uh, flipped through the DSM says, yeah, I don't know. I think you might have this. And uh, I said bipolar, I believe it was at the time, which I've gotten diagnosed for bipolar many times, even though I don't have bipolar. It's BPD undoubtedly for sure. Within 20 minutes, the meeting is over, and I have a pack in my hand, a sample pack of Lexapro. I go home that night, and I take the Lexapro, and that was the night that I destroyed my entire house. I came back the next day for an emergency meeting after having gone to the hospital, getting arrested basically by a SWAT team after running around with a knife and all this crazy stuff. I tell her the story, and she looks shocked. She's like, what do you mean you destroyed your whole house? Like she had no idea that giving somebody a medicine could have that big of an impact. I think it's irresponsible. I think they throw around meds too quickly. Uh, you do not need medicine to make it better. Um, some of it could take the edge off. Abilify did a good job of taking some of the edge off, but not at the dose they prescribed me. They wanted me to take two milligrams a day. That, that, that made me a zombie every day. But I dialed it down to nibbling a small quarter of the pill it was enough to give me a little bit of an edge to where I could kind of keep it together a little easier and then I could practice the skills. But it's, it is, it's, in my opinion, skills are the way to go. Um, you know, if there was a zombie apocalypse and you couldn't get your medicine, you really don't want to be crazy again, right? Um, bits of Laura, good morning to you. Uh, as always, a pleasure seeing you here. My treatment team and PO is making me go on meds next Friday or Friday, this Friday. I have mixed feelings. Hey, look, if, if it works, it works, okay? If it doesn't work, then just don't do it anymore. I mean, it's, it's that simple. I, I did have a lot of fears going into medicinal treatments for this. Um, it would help if you had somebody that you trust in your life um, who could tell you, hey, look, this is uh, changing you in a way that's not good. You should stop doing it. You know, my wife was um, that person towards the end when I really was, was hitting this as hard as I could. I'm like, well, what if they put me on a medicine? She's like, don't worry. If it changes you and I, I won't let it change you. You know, she knew what my fear was, right? There's a lot of different things going on when it comes to the medicines. Casey, good morning to you. Nice to see you as always. After getting my BPD diagnosis, I asked my parents and my dad uh, then told me he was diagnosed in 1994. Very, very, very common for our parents to have BPD or somebody older in our family to have BPD. It, it does pass down, you know, as mentioned. It's also just learned behavior. That's, that's, that's how it is. I, it's unfortunate. I look at it like a generational curse that needs to be broken. But I also have the perspective, as many of you know, um, that it's a superpower in disguise. So I wouldn't change it for the world. Like, you want to take away my BPD? Like, I'm not okay with that. I like having BPD. Now that I'm out of it, I love it. And everybody else loves it too. So, you know, it's a win-win. Eleanor says, what were the main skills that um, that I built that helped helped the most? That's a, that's a good one. There's so many different things that I had to implement into my life in order to get it better, um, in order to improve my behavior. I think that the number one skill was the one that stopped the most episodes and stopped the most splits. I would call it a combination of what I call objective analysis and space and time. Because we are lovers and passionate and we want people in our lives, uh, this means that we have to deal with other people. We have to deal with conflict. We have to understand how to deal with criticism, being judged, neglected. Um, getting into arguments, you know, all these kinds of things. So when I would get into an argument, I would implement a skill that I developed called space and time, but it's very, it's very defined. It's not the classic therapist definition where you just walk away for 30 minutes, come back and you're still just as pissed. You know, it, it's, it's a plan that's set up with your partner in advance. The first 30, you know, firstly, you have to know what each other is doing in this time, right? Um, for me, it's go for a drive. For my wife, it's read a book, for example. So we both know that nobody's packing their bags and leaving in the next hour when we implement the skill. You, you look for warning signs, you're going to have to repin this one that's up there in a minute, David. 
Um, you look for warning signs, things like voices being raised, objects being thrown or used, um, insults being made, personal insults, threats being made. I'm going to leave you. We should never be together. Those kinds of things. The second you see a warning sign, you separate. And for the first 30 minutes, you get to be angry. You get to be upset. You get to be, you know, whatever it is that you are. <clears throat> and I just, you know, you curse them out if you want to curse them out. You know, in the car, I'm like, I can't believe you do this to me. Blah, blah, blah. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. The second half of the time you have to, on your way back, basically, you have to come up with a few ideologies here. You have to understand objectively why they said what they said, what they meant, why would, in what world this person doesn't want to hurt me, in what world would they have the perspective they have? That's empathy. Then you have to come up with the common goals. Oh, we still want to be married. We still want a future together. This doesn't change that. You know, now you have commonality, right? Common ground. Then you need to come up with a compromise so that when you come back, you could say, also, you need to know where you're culpable. You come back and you say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. This is where I was wrong. This is what I think you meant. Is that right? And you repeat it to them until you get it right. And this is what I think we should do about it. Uh, living with BPD says if both parents have personality disorders, doesn't mean the child will have it. Uh, no, it doesn't. It just because the parents have um, personality disorder or really any condition does not mean that the child will ultimately get it. It is activated, right? It's activated by the environment. So if the parents have it under control, then the kid has an opportunity, right? Um, Teresa says, how do you consider it a superpower? Well, everything that's bad about BPD, once you get to remission, becomes good. You know, our um, fear of abandonment turns into a power where the people in our lives feel more belonging, like they belong. They feel more loyalty from us. They feel more commitment. Instead of us asking if our partner is going to leave all the time, we become a more supreme partner. And ironically, they, they don't want to leave, right? But they feel safer. They feel more secure. Uh, our paranoia becomes uh, problem solving and objective reasoning. You know, all of the stuff that, that was a problem, you know, all of the worries and the fears end up kind of crafted into a totally different perspective, a totally different behavior. And um, look at me, for example, you know, I had extreme empathy before, but it was, it was selfish before remission. I was worried. I was scared people were going to leave. So I put in everything I had uh, to try to get them to see me so I could, so that they would stay with me. But look at me now, now I'm like, let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you, you know, and, and, I'm helping other people and they're feeling like, you know, their place in the world matters more. Um, it's just, it the perspectives change and the things that, that we can do with, um, because we were typically very intelligent people, very astute individuals who can see big pictures when, when we're applying, you know, ourselves. Um, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It really is. Uh, that's why I say I'd never change it. Never for the world. Um, by the way, David is our moderator in chat. If you have any questions, you can direct them towards him. He's also a sensitive stability coach. And we do take live guests at this time. So if anybody has over a thousand followers and wants to be on the show for a few minutes, just let David know. After 50 says, BPD rage abuse creates PTSD in the lives of loved ones. Yep, the loved ones suffer. I often say they suffer just as much as we do. It's just a different type of suffering. It's not the same. It's not the same suffering. It's a different type. Um, they're going through something that is comparable, though, in, in energy. It's comparable in suffering. It's comparable in pain. And we are creating trauma in the lives of the people that are, are around us. Um, that is just something that happens before remission. And it sucks, but it's true. Genetic predisposition lies in development. Trauma creates cluster B. Yes, Correct. Um, that that's a good way of of delineating what's happening here, or or enumerating the topic a little bit more. It, you you don't even have to necessarily have the genes to develop it, um, but most of the time they believe that you know there are genes that you have had already, and then the trauma activates it. The trauma you know creates these behavior deviations um, that you you know you and I know as BPD. Um, good to see you this morning, Greenbird. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure. Man, I love um, all the questions, guys, and I love the community. Uh, as we always say, it, it's it's easier together. 
it's a harder apart, right? So stronger together is the idea here. Uh, and I, I don't want people to feel like we're, we're missing your question or you're unheard. If, if for some reason your question goes unanswered or we can't catch it or we've missed it somehow, please don't hesitate to email me. I am a couple days behind on emails, but today I have a very um, big, clear early morning. Uh, so I will be knocking out emails and I will have them all caught up by the end of the workday today. Um, I specifically kept my schedule lighter today because I knew I was falling behind on emails. So, you know, if you've been waiting, you will be heard and I will make sure that I respond in detail. I never ignore anyone. Uh, I, I always want to make sure that I put good time into what I'm doing. Um, I don't want someone who's telling me their life story to feel completely unheard. David is amazing. <laughs> yeah, David is amazing. Um, bringing him on board and making him a part of the Sensitive Stability family was the smartest decision I've ever made with this company. He does a fantastic job. Um, he is, sometimes I get really backed up and really busy to the point where it is, um, easier to reach David to reach me sometimes. So, you know, if there's something urgent and I haven't gotten to an email or something and it's, it's a priority, um, please, you know, reach out to David, let him know too. He is a uh, part of the team that, that is, um, essential for us to be able to help as many people and grow the way that we're growing. Good morning, AJ. Good to see you. Um, we were talking about BPD and loved ones. Uh, however, you know, we are at a point where anybody who wants to come on could come on. No pressure, no stress. Uh, I know it's not easy to share yourself with the world. Um, I've just gotten used to it is, is the truth. And I've just been putting myself out there in the way that I have for so long now that um, it's second nature to me. And I, the thing about it is, um, we're all suffering with this condition to some extent, or we have, right? So there's a common bond here. You know, when, when somebody says something, most of us can relate to it. A lot of you relate to a lot of the things that I'm saying. Uh, that is a, that's a byproduct of experience is what that is. And when we're having similar experiences, we create a bond. That's, that's why we see so many of the same people, um, you know, who are part of our, our team now, our community. Uh, and I think it's great that everybody is always supporting everybody else. That's, that's very, very rare. Um, in terms of the trauma that is being created, somebody had commented a little while ago and they had talked about how BPD creates trauma in the loved ones, right? It changes their perspective of us. You know how every time we have an episode, this is something that I wanted to touch base on today. And it just reminded me, you know, we have an episode and we're really worried that our partner's going to leave after that, you know, or our friend's going to leave. You know, they just witnessed something completely chaotic, something totally crazy. And the next morning you wake up and you're like, oh my God, are they going to leave? Are you going to, you know, can you, are you going to stay with me? Do you forgive me? And, and they always kind of placate us and say, you know, yeah, um, I forgive you, right? But I want us to understand something here. And this use this as motivation. I want us to understand that it will always change the way that they look at us. You can't look at somebody the same way after they have threatened uh, themselves, for instance. Oh, good morning. Good morning. You kind of uh, had a perfect um, segue. I think that's Laura, right? I can't it see. It is. Oh, looks looks like me. it is. So with family and all that and with you with you guys and me really feeling Yes, you could have accepted. BPD and ADHD. I do and many of my clients do. Uh, it's very, very common. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Um, so how do I keep from favorite person? I'm really people? sorry. Always, Mom. It's good to see you too, um, by the way. Good to see you. Uh, I I have accidentally hurt, it, hurt people. Um, not intentionally, but it has happened as a byproduct of the episode. Episodes can be severe. They can be super, super, super tough. Um, some of the most horrible consequences come out of our episodes, come out of our splits. And it is unbelievably heartbreaking, some of the stuff that I've done personally, some of the things that I've witnessed, some of the things that I know my clients have done. It, it's a heartbreaking thing. Um, and, it, and it becomes harder and harder every time. 
uh, for our partners. That that's the truth of it, and it, it's it's tough. But um, people now can does change. It work? Anybody can change with the right amount of effort. That that is the truth. Um, as, as a mother, you might be one of the only targets. If there's somebody in your life who has BPD, a child, for instance. They're going to lash out, but if they have a partner, the partner, I, I guarantee you, is suffering to an extreme. Can you hear to me an now? Extreme. Um, but the parents are then next usually to get it. Oh, yeah. Is, is she live? Are you live, Laura? Are you here? Yeah, it's my phone. See, uh, my screen, she's not loaded. Um, huh. I, she's been trying to load. I don't know if there's an issue with her phone. Ah. So I've just been, oh, oh, I see. So she, I can't hear her, but she can. Okay, let me try this. Let me see. Boop. <laughs> I don't know what the deal is with that there. Um, I could not hear her at all. So I don't know what the deal is with that. Um, I would say if somebody else could hop on just so we could see if we can hear the voice. But, you know. Um, I would love to have Laura on. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know what, what the problem is. It's weird that other people can hear her. Um, yeah, that would be great if you don't mind. I'd just like to see if it's if it's something on my end. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if there's something that I did. Okay, here we go. Can you hear me? How's it going, AJ? It's good. Can you hear me? Do people can people hear AJ right now? So I've seen this just so people in the chat know. I've seen this in a friend's live. Okay. To be clear, and I can't hear AJ right now. Okay, so there's a problem with my hear end, us. it looks like. Um, yeah. That's unfortunate. I don't know how to fix that. I've seen it before. We're just going to have to do a, a chat question. I don't really know what I can do to fix that. I mean, maybe take these earphones. No. Before, the, uh, my friend had to reset, but we'll just have to do question. I'm going to hop out, though, guys. Okay. Can you, are, can you hear me right now, AJ? I hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I'll just uh, hop out and I'll hop back in real quick. No. Nah. One second, guys. Let me see if I can get that right. I don't even know if I can do that. I gotta make a. Hmm. I guess let me let me try to get um, David as a guest. I don't know, guys. I'm not sure what's going on. Usually, I don't have this kind of problem. Okay, well, I, I I don't think I've muted anybody. I I did check. Um, I did check the muting the mute settings on that individual on both people that tried to join. Um, hmm. Yeah, I I guess we'll just um we'll we'll just have to stick to the chat today. I'll have to troubleshoot this later. So, my question today, Laura says, um, how do I keep from favorite personing people. Uh, okay, I got you, AJ. Thank you for that. I don't know what the problem is. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, maybe I can try to invite. I'll try to invite Laura while I answer her question. Um, let's see if I can do that. Maybe if I'm the one that invites, it'll solve the problem. So, um, hmm, I I can't even invite Laura to the thing. That, that is an issue. Okay, whatever, guys. Um, so. Maybe um, change your perspective, Laura, a little bit, you know, because uh, here's here's the thing about it. You are looking at the favorite person complex like it's entirely a bad thing when in reality um, it's it's not a bad thing. It's how we choose to have a favorite person. It's what. A favorite person means and most importantly it is an expectation versus reality type of thing uh, what I mean is we have favorite people that we put on a pedestal right and we treat them extraordinarily well with the expectation deep down that it will be returned that's the problem because the non BPD person will never be able to do what we do in terms of putting someone on a pedestal. It's just not, it's just not how it works. It's not very healthy. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and if you want to have a favorite person or you have a favorite person, I do, it's, it's my wife. I still have a favorite person. 
Um, I just am careful as to what I expect. I say, okay, she's a neurotypical person. Um, the way that I express energy is through love and passion, right? And care. So she gets like two full body massages a week, man. You know, I can't expect the same. If I expect the same, I will build resentment and it will ruin that relationship. But it's okay if I want to display my passion and love for her in that way. And I understand that as a neurotypical person and me being in a neurotypical social norm relationship, that I am going to be giving over the top and I, I need to be okay with that without expecting over the top back, and then it works fine. Now, she treats me wonderfully, don't get, don't get me wrong, um, but there is still a social norm scale. And if I wanna go outside of that and she's okay with it and she's all right with it, and I'm not expecting too much in return, it's who's to say that that's not healthy, you know? Uh, BPD and narcissism are very commonly um, misdiagnosed sometimes. I was diagnosed with both NPD and BPD, uh, and I would basically split. I, I believe I had both of them for sure. I would split from BPD into an NPD person. I would go from being very empathetic and caring to all of a sudden not caring at all and you know separating myself any way that I could. Uh, it was miserable. It was totally miserable. Um, and it's hard for the people in our lives too, you know, because it's almost like we have, you know, we have a, a, a sort of buffer that we won't let people get through and we will activate the NPD as a sort of defense mechanism. Look, life is, um, they're talking about labels here. When we're talking about BPD, NPD and all that, it's just labels. That's what it is. Uh, life is a scale though. There's all these scales. You know, I believe that we're all on every scale. I think we're all on the schizophrenia, schizophrenia scale, only we might be a zero, right? Most of us. Some have full-blown schizophrenia, and it's a 10. You know, other times it's, you know, narcissism. I'm probably like an eight on the narcissist scale. I'm probably like a 10 on the BPD scale. Um, you know, in remission, obviously I look at things differently, but I'm trying to uh, sort of explain how it works. So, yeah, I, I would have loved to have um, Laura, you know, work. I, I did check the guest settings again. You know, I was looking at them. I, I don't see anything abnormal. I, I'm looking at the guest settings right now. And I see nothing in here that would that would change um, the ability for, for a guest to talk. That's, that's a shame. Uh, I'm going to try one more time to invite you, Laura, just because it's, it's I'm going to be honest, guys. It's driving me absolutely crazy, man. Whoa. Can you hear me now? And she just, she's talking right now, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Hmm. It's okay. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing everything I can, anything I can control here. Well, Laura, if you want to say anything to community. Oh, there you go. When you just showed up, the video's there. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, if you want to say anything, please do feel free to. I can't hear you personally. It's all right. I just, I struggle sometimes with the whole favorite person thing, but new insight. And I'm glad to have new insight on it. Hi, David. <laughs> I want to disconnect now, though. <laughs> Uh oh, not good. Earbuds, I tried playing the volume. I tried another set of earbuds. Um, I couldn't get any of it back. Yeah, it's okay. Look, um, we'll, we'll try to troubleshoot that. I'll do a little research. Uh, I do believe, okay, he, David said that other lives are struggling with this too. So it looks like it's a, just a, a problem. I'll look into it, though, because I, I want to be able to have you guys on. Um, this is – your voice being heard is, is just as important as my voice being heard, okay? Oh, my God. You're saying you can't hear me? Are you serious? Can, can you guys hear me right now? <laughs> okay. All right. Good, 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 good. 
Oh man, that, that is super frustrating, but you know, look at how many people were willing to deal with that. That's, that's great, man. Um, God, I, I got to get that fixed. That's, that's going to, that's going to drive the OCD in me crazy. That OCD, that's not remission, baby. <laughs> mm. But um, anyway, I like the OCD. That's, that's how it is. Um, Laura's talking about last night. We started this new thing. Uh, as you guys know, we do um, lives Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Uh, US EST. And as David said, yes, it's so cool that we're all together. Um, we are also doing lives now at 10 p.m. US EST on Tuesdays, where we just kind of talk, uh, David and I and whoever's there. It's sort of just like hanging out. You get to know us a little bit better, um, that kind of thing. And then um, on Thursdays, we're talking about doing um, another another live, but I'm going to let David um, announce that tomorrow morning. Um, yes, here in TikTok is where this is all going to happen. Uh, and I, I'm going to probably start streaming it on YouTube as well, if that's easier for some people, but I'm not quite at that point yet where you know I'm doing that. Uh, but yeah, it's sometimes it's, it's sometimes we just need to be around people to understand us. It's not all about trying to figure everything out. I mean, some of it is just having people, you know, having friends, having, you know, support, having people who, who care, you know, it was, gr Laura, it was great to see your face. You know, I know that I couldn't hear what you were saying, but it was great to see your face. And I know that um, we all need to be seen in that sense to some degree. It's 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 a rough world out there, guys. Uh, if no matter whether you have BPD or not, you know, and you just have somebody in your life, or you just suffering from general trauma, it's a cruel, hard world, and there needs to be places where people feel like they belong. And, and where the care is authentic and some people's messages are getting cut in half. Yeah. Uh, TikTok is splitting. That's funny. <laughs> that's, that's creative. Yeah, it seems so. I've never had an issue with having somebody on before. I've never, um, not been able to hear somebody in a live, but, uh, I guess it's just something that's happening. I, I'm going to look into it today though, so I can be on top of this for tomorrow's show. Um, and for those of you who, are just showing up here now. This is a, a BPD live. We talk about borderline personality disorder. Um, today's topic, for example, was um, loved ones. Usually we'll talk for about 25 to 30 minutes about a specific topic. And then the second half of the show, we will allow people to call in. We're just having trouble with that. Uh, Living with BPD says in David's podcast, oh my goodness, if you haven't heard it, please listen. Surviving podcast is available basically anywhere. Spotify, you could find, you know, clips and stuff on YouTube. It's obviously in the podcast. I guess you'd call that store or marketplace or whatever. Um, it's great. It's great. He features a uh, new survivor of some type of trauma every week. And it is wildly... Um, entertaining but also revealing you know it's it's an awareness thing uh some of the guests he has on his show are just phenomenal that's actually how david and i met he had invited me to be a guest on a show of which i did do it's it's not published yet but uh, um i finished the podcast and i said to myself i've got to work with this guy i've got to work with this guy i don't have podcasts but um you know we're gonna we're gonna shelf that uh topic for the moment um it's kind of a part of a big announcement uh, and i'm not ready to reveal that at the moment um david and i are talking about things um and and we're going to do some pretty cool stuff together uh but uh, hopefully you know everybody understands at this point that you know he is an equal part of the team if you know you need something or you need to reach me and i i'm unable to respond at the moment you can always go through him to get there a little quicker. Uh, if you have any questions or comments that you want to be uh, have addressed, then asking him. That's my buddy Sam. You just saw there. He makes uh, semi regular appearances. I I, uh, I love it when Sam comes. It brightens my day, man. Um, even more than the orange juice does. That, that's the truth about that. Uh, but anyway, I want everybody to understand that you're not alone, and I also want you to know that this is an 
uh, an overall safe place to be. Um, there's no discrimination here, no matter what background, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what gender, sexual preference, um, no matter how you identify, uh, where you come from in life, what you've experienced, your traumas, your tribulations, your current circumstances. All of these things are irrelevant here in the sense that we welcome you no matter what, and we're super glad that you're part of the community. We just want everyone to feel like they belong, you know? Uh, one place in the world where we can all meet and, and actually have a good time and make progress in our life, um, make a dent in our own mini universe, so to speak, right? After 50 says, I love my daughter so much that I always want to learn um, to help and to support her. I feel you. I wish that my parents had that same attitude. I really do. Uh, it, it, I think it's tremendous that you are doing whatever you can as a parent. I think that's phenomenal. And there's not enough people in the world who are understanding when it comes to this condition. There's not enough empathy when, when it comes to BPD. There is a tremendous stigma that is, is wildly painful and, and, and it's very detrimental to our growth. It makes it so hard to get help. It makes us so hard to be seen, to be heard. Um, and this isn't just in the mental health community. In general, people hear personality disorder. I mean, I remember the first time somebody told me about this. I thought, personality disorder? What do you mean? Like, like you know, a beautiful mind? <laughs> like, that's where my mind was going. Of course, he had schizophrenia, right? But My mind went to the worst places. I felt super alone. I felt super scared. I thought the world was going to reject me. I thought, um, I can't tell anybody I have personality disorder like that. That that's, that's critical. I would get declined things like life insurance, you know, for my wife. Oh, but I, I argued with those fuckers. <laughs> I argued to the point where they just eventually said, all right, Give them the give them the life insurance. <laughs> so I won that battle, but it took me months. I was going back and forth with the life insurance company for months, right? Uh, before I finally uh, won that, and they they went ahead and um, gave it to me. So I actually have life insurance, even though I have BPD. I just had to prove to them um, on paper that I was in remission. That's that's what I had to do ultimately. So I had to go back to, you know, a psychiatrist, get them re-review it. I didn't care if I, you know, they re-reviewed or not. I knew I was in remission, but I needed that paperwork to say I was, that was the ultimate deciding decision. And they didn't ask me for that. I went out of my way on my own to get that. Um, always mom has sent several mess or comments to the chat, but I couldn't catch them all. Uh, please let her let's see yeah I, I i struggle with the comments guys that's that's that is true uh know that we are here and sorry that i missed the comments yeah i i i am sorry um when we miss some comments it's not intentional there there's a lot going on david does a great job of moderating but you know sometimes i'm running my mouth so much on one comment and he's got the next one ready to pin you know, and, and at times I get a little carried away. Um, I answer something a little too deeply. Uh, and and, and I, I want to answer everything deeply. I really do. Uh, but I have to also pay respect to the fact that there are many people here, right? Many people here that, that all need answers, that all need help. Uh, and yes, I, I would love to have people on. Usually um, we do the guest part right now. TikTok has some problem to where I can't hear any of the guests. So we were, you know, we had to scrap that part today, unfortunately. And that's, that's one of my favorite parts about this is talking to people um, at that stage. So uh, that sucks. That's unfortunate, right? But, you know, we'll try again tomorrow. I'll do a little research tonight. I'll try to figure out um, what's going on. Uh, for our last question here, before we end the live, being a wife and favorite person is really hard. I love him dearly, but everything is dependent on me. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, everything is dependent on you. You are his identity right now. If he is not in remission, right, then he has made you part of his identity, which is that's the unhealthy side of this, right? Oh, yeah. Living with BPD. I did get sleep last night. Um, I totally did. I struggled to go into bed, but I talked to David after the after the live for a few minutes so we can prepare for the morning. And he, he basically forced me to sleep. 
<laughs> that's 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 good because uh I need that type of compliment in my life. Otherwise, I will just work until my brain just dies, right? Um, sleep is important, all of that. So, um, you know, I, I forget the name of this hat style. I really do, but I love it. I've had it for a couple of years. Uh, it's a great hat. It's authentic. comes from Ireland. Uh, that, that, that all said, though, we are at the end of our BPD morning show. Um, with sensitive stability. I want to thank David again. He is the moderator here. And um, I want to thank everyone else who is helping. AJ is another moderator. Um, so, you know, in the future, if you have questions that you need to be pinned or whatnot, you can invite them. It's not called a golf cap. There's an actual term. I forget what it is, but, you know, dungeon master hat. I like it. Dungeon master. Anyway, yeah. Thank you, um, Sincera. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'll make sure that next time that you're around, I'll put in a little extra effort so that I can do a little bit better specifically for you, my friend. Anyway, guys, I love you all. Thank you so much for being here. It was a great show, and I will see you again tomorrow, um, bright and early, 7 a.m., U.S. EST. Have a good day, and don't be hard on yourselves.